You're listening to the Radical Departures podcast, your source for startup storytelling. I'm your host, Abby Klein. On the show, I interview entrepreneurs and other professionals from throughout the French and greater European startup ecosystems. We look at some of the interesting new developments that have taken place in France over the last few years and how the country is developing into a startup nation. On Radical Departures, you'll hear founders of some of the hottest companies share their stories and important things they've learned along the way. If you like the podcast, please subscribe and leave us a review in iTunes. This is episode 40 of the Radical Departures podcast. My guest today is Hélène Marion, co-founder and CEO of YouBooks. That's Y-O-O-B-O-O-X, the Spotify of books. It's a startup that provides a streaming subscription-based model to read the books and magazines of your choice anywhere, anytime. Their content is currently mostly in French, but they've got plans for global expansion this year. More on that in the episode. We discuss Hélène's background as a serial entrepreneur, the challenges of competing in the same space alongside Amazon, her passion for innovation, and much more. So without further ado, here's episode 40 with Hélène Marion. My guest today is Hélène Marion, CEO and founder of YouBooks. Welcome, Hélène. Thank you. Hi, Abby. So what need were you trying to fill by creating YouBooks? When I created your books, it was very simple. We wanted to use technology to make reading and books available to everyone. Simple. Easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when did you start? Give us a little bit of background about you, about your books. Yeah, I started your books about six years ago. And uh, it was just uh, when smartphones and tablets were you know, just starting to develop. And uh, for us, I mean, our model was very uh, simple. We wanted to make a Spotify for books because I was just a great fan of Spotify and all the access models. And uh, I believe that this was the future of uh, distribution of culture. Obviously, you know, also in love with books and love reading. And my, my children love reading. And so, you know, I said, you have to do it for books. What was your background? I mean, you love reading. Are you an author? Did you work in a library? What is your just passionate? No, I'm just a happy reader <laughs> of uh, various books. I mean, I was a great, I've always been a great fan of uh, comic books. I have uh, so many comic books at home and at my parents' house. And then uh, novels and, uh, you know, I now uh, read quite a lot of uh, development books, practical books. Basically, I'm just, you know, a user of this great product, which is, uh, you know, uh, reading. And uh, my background is not at all literature. If I came from, uh, you know, publishing sector or uh, literature, I probably wouldn't have um, made that project because it was, you know, I would have uh, thought, you know, it's going to be too hard. And so uh, it was a great thing that I came from uh, actually a scientific background. I'm a pure product of French education. So I've done everything, you know, perfectly uh, according to what my, my parents wanted me to do until a certain point. You know, I studied mathematics, went to engineering school. Then went to HSA because I didn't want to do only, you know, numbers and financials. And, and then at that point, I was, uh, you know, about to go into this, uh, you know, wonderful career uh, that everybody's dreaming about in France. And, you know, just uh, enter L'Oreal or uh, CAC 40, a big company, and then you make your career there. And uh, at that point, I did something completely different. I went to London. All my friends were just saying, oh, are you crazy? Well, it's you know, raining over there and you, you don't eat properly. And, you know, English people are so mean and all these bullshit that you hear. And I uh, stayed there eight years. I loved it. I studied in finance. Nobody's perfect. So I started uh, <laughs> working for an American company <laughs> called uh, Merrill Lynch and did some uh, mergers and acquisitions for five years. And then internet arrived because when I started working, I'm not that young. I know I look very young, but I am not. <laughs> when I started working, there were no emails. You probably don't know. Uh, <laughs> Crazy. <like. laughs> uh, but we were, you know, uh, just putting uh, 40 pages, is, you know, fax during all night long to mm. Chile or some other place. And uh, internet arrived and startups started to create. And I got pulled into the uh, sort of internet world and uh, startup world. In uh, 1998, actually, I joined a, a UK company called Egg. It was one of the first online banks in Europe. It was a great success. We convinced 3 million people in two years. 
wow. to start bank, you know, banking online, which was really new at that point. And the founders were so innovative people, you know, they were completely integrated into the uh, digital startup ecosystem at that point. They knew some, uh, some guys in a garage in the States, uh, you know, building a project called Google. They, you know, just that little thing. <laughs> and, you know, I, I sort of uh, was part of this adventure of Egg as, a, you know, part of the team, really. And it was a five-year great adventure. We IPO'd the company for one billion pounds. It was a great success. And then the founders wanted to go international. And then we bought a company in France, rebranded Egg and relaunched the whole thing under the, the Egg brand. And that was a complete disaster. And, uh, and that's when I learned everything that you can't do when you go international. If you want to go international, there's a number of things that you shouldn't do. Well, we've done all of these. <laughs> <laughs> and then Egg was bought out by um, Citigroup. I uh, joined a new project, which was uh, called Poeo. It was created by uh, Charles Begbede, which is a very well-known uh, French entrepreneur. The challenge was to compete with EDF, the big energy company in France, in the context of the liberalization of the market. So I prepared the marketing launch of Poeo and uh, built all the website, the offer, and was part of this adventure as well. And then that's when I decided that, you know, actually I wanted to create my own project and that, you know, it was possible and it was not that difficult because uh, I wouldn't have, you know, even thought about uh, becoming an entrepreneur given my background. I you know I was daughter of two teachers, did all the studies and uh, did everything as I was expected. And, but uh, in and fact, you I, were... You know, something went wrong. And I think I was always an entrepreneur as a, you know, a person, uh, probably some, somebody who wanted to change the world and explore new opportunities and just, you know, be also the player of my own destiny and then, and, you know, change something and make a real change in, in people's life. And also build a team, build a company together with a team and uh, create a success out of it. And this is, uh, this is what we're doing at UBooks every day. So I'm really happy. Before UBooks, I've created uh, another company called Cocoon, which was kind of Airbnb, but, you know, uh, for uh, quality places. And then we closed that one because we, we didn't get along well uh, between the founders and actually it didn't work. And that's when I created your books. This was before the startup ecosystem, as we know it in Paris, really took off. Because that's more recent. No, you were kind of at the beginning. Yes, yeah, sure. Ahead of the curve. <laughs> sure. I remember the before uh, the uh, startup nation world, uh, which was a world in France. When I came back from the UK, because I, I lived eight years in the UK, when I came back to France, I was astonished by the different business culture there was and I was British and I started working in the UK so I you know I, I, all my reflexes were sort of you know UK American business more positive culture. yeah <laughs> positive <laughs> focus on you know results and objectives process efficiency and uh, yeah it was a quite a shock when I came back <laughs> and also people had this perspective on entrepreneurs and companies and CEOs that was, you know, was quite negative. It was still, you know, a vision that said uh, she's a patron. Patron is, is, uh, is bad mm. in France. It was really uh, quite negative. And, and then some people started uh, creating more and more companies with, with internet. And I remember in 2014, there was a launch of uh, the French tech by uh, Fleur Pellerin, who was the first minister that knew what internet was and that was quite uh, digital and uh, you know saw this as an opportunity rather than a risk and she launched this initiative French Tech and that was the starting point of a different vision about entrepreneurs in France you know four years five years after that it's a completely different world I'm so happy to see my country thinking that it's cool to be an entrepreneur, that it's, uh, they're creating employment, they're creating energy, they're developing the economy. This is how people think about entrepreneurs now. It's sexy. It's fantastic. And I love my job. I don't think I will ever go back to a big company. I think I really, I mean, I love to develop a startup. I love to be able to make a difference every day to the company I, I'm in. I'm really happy that uh, we have so many entrepreneurs now and that so many young people 
when they finish their studies in France, they don't even think about L'Oréal anymore. They don't even think about Merrill Lynch anymore. They don't even think about uh, PwC anymore. They think, I'm going to create my own startup. That's a big change here also because the tradition has always been get a CDI and stay in the job. It's traditionally been quite hard to change career here. It's quite scary because your job ties you to, you know, you have an apartment because you have a CDI and all of that. And I think that's changing slowly, maybe, but it's changing. Yeah, it's it completely changed. At least uh, the young generations don't think about it uh, the same way. That's for sure. The and, services uh, are catching up to that. Yeah, it's not really a risk to create your company. I mean, you take the risk to have a lot of fun. Also a lot of uh, problems and a lot of things to sort out. It's probably not for everyone. So I would say that to like being a startup, create a company, you have to, I think, be excited about change and uh, having new things to sort out every day and love adapting to new situations. It's my case. This is why, you know, I sort of feel so, so good in this job. But uh, if you like to have a very settled frame in which you can work and uh, that, you know, you want to follow a plan, it's probably not for you. But then, you know, yeah, that's, that's fine. Okay. It's, it's OK. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what were some of the challenges when you got started? I mean, you already had plenty of experience with you books when you set out to create this totally new thing six years ago. What were some of the issues that you faced? Not being from the publishing world specifically, that was, imagine, somewhat uh. of a learning curve. <laughs> well, when we started, we started, you know, drawing some screens on paper sheets with uh, my co-founder, Fabien. And nobody knew how to make applications at that time. So the first challenge was, how are we going to be able to make a product that works and used by some customers. And so that was the first challenge. And that worked because we had, you know, Fabien and Vincent, my co-founders, who made it work. And, uh, and the first version of our app was, was so ugly, you couldn't, you couldn't imagine. <laughs> it was purple. It was, <laughs> it was really sad. And we decided to launch it anyway because we wanted to, you know, get the feedback right. from the customers. Uh, that was the best decision we took because uh, we learned so much. We learned so much for six months. We made the best product, you know, out of this feedback. The second challenge was the publishers. Publishers were not even thinking about uh, digital at that time. It's really a paper industry. They're passionate. They're passionate about books and, and reading and, and authors. But they, they believe in paper books. And they think the digital opportunity is going to be negative for them. They think it's, uh, it means a decrease in their business. Mm. I think the contrary. I think technology and digital is a fantastic opportunity to open the reading uh, sector to everyone in the world. It makes uh, it much more accessible. Some people don't have access to books right? just because there, there are no libraries or it's too expensive. And I think uh, digital is a real opportunity for uh, books. So uh, we were seen as a problem by them at the beginning and they, they just didn't want to, to uh, enable us to get some books in, in the product innovators in this sector. And these were the uh, sci-fi publishers. Interesting. And so they were the first ones who came to our model. And then, you know, we progressed. Now we have 500 French publishers and we're starting to get some English languages publishers as well. Because so uh, far the product has been only available in France? Yes, it's available worldwide, but it's a French-speaking application. Okay. It's a French-speaking service with about 120,000 books and magazines and press titles, but mainly in French. We have designed a multilingual version of the app, which will be available uh, this year. And uh, we are currently negotiating some you know, press and book uh, catalogs in English okay. and in some other languages, European languages. So we're starting in to become international in terms of uh, service. And uh, also because the French readers are asking for English books as well. I have to ask a question. How do you compete then with the obvious, the elephant in the room, the Amazon? You know, how do you compete with Kindle? How has that been for you? Kindle has launched a subscription model two years after us in France uh, because initially they didn't have one. Actually, we, we were a pioneer, really. Mm. I mean, we launched this subscription model just on the same model as Spotify in 2011, and we were the only one together with a Spanish service. Mm. So two years after that, Amazon launched Kindle Unlimited, 
And uh, we had a, a big regulatory change following that because uh, the government in France, you know, suddenly said, oh, subscription models might not be legal because there's the loi uh, du prix unique, uh, loi longue, and uh, you have to check you are compliant with this law. And so there was this big risk that arrived following the launch of Amazon. So for us, it was actually a very good news that they launched it because it's a reference in the sector, Amazon, and the fact that they go and they launch similar products uh, means that, you know, the market is big and that they'll help us develop the market. But the bad news was that, you know, everybody was trying to block it in France mm. and uh, we could uh, have, uh, you know, been basically sort of a side... Uh, like collateral damage? Yeah, collateral damage mm. of this. This was the 23rd of December when the, the, <laughs> the French government said, oh, that might not be legal. So that was uh, quite a, a shock. For me, when something like this happened, it makes me more combative. So I said, you know, we just fought and we discussed and we found a solution and we found a regulatory uh, framework mm -hmm. that would uh, be, uh, you know, uh, compliant to this law. And we developed it and we put it in place. And, uh, you know, it took us about a year, but we managed to uh, avoid the obstacle. When you say, yeah, you have, you know, Amazon is your competitor. Well, Amazon is a competitor to everyone. Mm -hmm. so <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and today, I don't think books are the sort of a top priority of Amazon. You know, no. they have AWS. I mean, they, they're in other businesses. Books is history. So it's an important business in their history. But uh, if you worry about Amazon, you know, don't launch anything mm. because they, they're quite, you know, present present. Everywhere, yeah. everywhere. And then you can uh, have a service, which is a specialist service. And that competes favorably to Amazon. And it's our case. I mean, customers choose U-Books rather than Amazon because Amazon doesn't have as many French-speaking uh, books as we have in our subscription. And because we have a much nicer uh, recommendation service and, uh, you know, recommendation to our readers. So, you know, we do more than just providing books. We can compete with, with uh, you know, Kindle Unlimited. Uh, also because I think our publishers, partners are... Uh, ready to help us do that because they need to develop the market. They need alternatives to mm. Amazon. In terms of funding, what did you choose to do with you books? Was it did you grow it organically? Did you get investors? We grew it uh, organically at the beginning, uh, also because uh, there was some government uh, help that was available for our project. So we we could uh, raise a bit of money to be able to do the first sort of proof of concept of the product, and then we raised some uh, friends and family money, about 200,000 to be able to sort of uh, commercialize the product for the first year. And then we did uh, three other uh, proper uh, fundraising. And uh, since the beginning, we've raised about 3.5 million euro to develop your books. We are currently uh, about to start a new uh, fundraising to actually scale the company now because uh, we found our business model where you know, our business model is clearly a paying subscription model. We've developed it uh, in a B2C way, but also in B2B. And so we're distributing uh, our service through uh, hotels, through transport companies, through oh. telecom uh, operators. And this is working quite well. So we're hoping to you know, be able to, to accelerate that now. So we were just about uh, to start a new uh, fund round to be able to finance that. That's an interesting hybrid model. Yeah, because if you're going to make books available to everyone, I mean, the easiest way to do it and the most uh, rapid way to do it is to uh, take advantage of big platforms that already exist and, and be able to touch uh, millions of customers quickly. And that's the best way. So you mentioned that you're, you're going international, you're going to raise this next round. What else do you envision for the future? What's your dream for your books? Your books can be the, the Spotify for books uh, worldwide. So this is my dream. I think uh, what I want is that U-Books can uh, make books available in uh, all the way possible as well. So anywhere, anyone, any, at any moment you want to read something, uh, U-Books has to adapt to your way of life, to your, you know, the experience of U-Books has to adapt. So if you want to uh, continue reading in an audio way, we need to be able to provide you the audio mm. you know, version of the books. And uh, you need to be able to share books with your friends. 
you need to to be able to you know have a different experience of books thanks to technology which means it's easier because you can take all the books with you at any time uh, you can read in any way you want uh, depending on what you're doing at that time and also i think you should be able to discover new uh, books and readings uh, in the way you want uh, in a much more social way i would like very much you books to be able to change the reading experience it's not just history no i make a stand for it so that's great <laughs> So, Ellen, thank you for joining me. I have one more question for you before you go. How do you personally define success? For me, success is to be really happy in what you do at every point in time during your day. So for me, being an entrepreneur is part of, of my own success, but there are plenty of other things that are part of it. You have to be happy with yourself. And for me, success is really about being happy with who you are, what you do, and uh, enjoy it. Le kiff. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. That wraps up another episode of Radical Departures. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and leave us a review and let us know who you'd like to hear on the show. Catch you next week. <laughs>